Hello, my name is Brendan and welcome to Central Park. First things first, uh, some of you were accidentally promoted to panelist and then I had to demote you. <laughs> Don't take offense to it. There's some confusion. A lot of people signed in under the same name for some reason. Not a problem. Don't worry about it. I think we're good to go now, but I'm sorry about that. It was probably a little bit confusing for some of you. Second, I'm on a computer that I used a while back, and last time I used it, it died in the middle of the program. So just fingers crossed that we're good to go today. Uh, if something happens, just stay on and I'll be right back. I work for the Central Park Conservancy. Central Park Conservancy is the nonprofit organization that takes care of Central Park year round. And we know that getting to Central Park is not an option for everyone. So we wanted to bring the park to you through short weekly strolls through the park every 1230, every Wednesday at 1230. Uh, we go on this virtual lunchtime stroll. And today we're going to stroll around the conservatory water. And I'm going to show you some great trees and some really whimsical statues. Now, we're gonna to be together for about 15 minutes. All the photos that you're going to see were taken in the last week by me. And before we go, a little bit of housekeeping. All right. Uh, you can use uh, the chat feature, which some of you already have, to say hello and to comment. You can also use the Q&A feature to ask any questions that you have. And I have colleagues, uh, Jose and Juan on the back end and they're gonna be answering questions as we go. And you'll also be invited to participate in a few polls, uh, and you're gonna see one of those momentarily. And you just click, and then it will go away. On to our program. So this is a map of the route that we're gonna to take today. Uh, and you can see that we're gonna enter at East 79th Street, and then we're gonna walk south and circle Conservatory Water. Now we started these weekly walks 11 weeks ago, so this is our 11th walk. And that's pretty great. And we're really thankful that you are here today. And many of you, I'm sure, are here for the second or third time. We've really enjoyed showing you how Central Park has changed uh, over the season. And I would actually like to know how many of you are here for the second or third time. So I'm going to launch a poll right now that you should see appear on your screen. And if you wouldn't mind just voting and let us know if this is your first walk or if you've been on a few of them. Uh, most of them and some of you very well might have been on all 11 and if so that's very cool um i will share the results and we'll see who's with us in just a bit now if you missed previous walks all of them are available on our website and my colleagues they're going to drop the link into the chat right now uh, so you can find them okay let's get into the park This is the 79th Street gate. Now, if you've joined us on our past walks, you're gonna remember that all the entrances to Central Park, they actually have names, and they're named after groups of New Yorkers who were central to the park's history or to New York's history. And this is actually called Miner's Gate. And that's really fitting, considering the 79th Street Traverse is just north, and creating that was basically a mining operation. Uh, moving in, we come to this really peaceful lawn at the base of this gradually sloping hill. Now this whole area is called Cedar Hill due to the stands of evergreens that are at the crest of this hill. And early in the park's history, there were far more conifers than there are today. Uh, many of those died over the years. They were replaced by deciduous trees or not replaced at all. Uh, and there are some, however, that are still scattered throughout the landscape. The Conservancy, when trees die in this area, uh, thinking about the original intention of the area and the design of the park, we're very mindful about the trees that we choose to put back in. A quick reminder, uh, a coniferous tree is a tree that has needles and they usually keep them all winter and a deciduous tree has leaves that usually fall off in the winter. There are exceptions though, and I'm gonna show you one of those exceptions in just a moment. Now, as we walk along the path, we get to a deciduous tree, which is on our left. That is a European beech. And then on the right is a coniferous tree, and that's a Norway spruce. And do you see how the Norway spruce, the branches are a little bit droopy? And that's actually just how the tree grows. It's not starving for water. And that's because the droopy branches help it shed snow in the winter, which is pretty cool. Uh, its needles are very sharp, and very tough and very hardy and very pokey. Let's see who's here. Uh, end polling, share results, 
most of you, uh, 80 of you who voted have been on most of these weekly walks, which is incredible. For the 27 people who are here for the first time, hello and welcome. Uh, we hope to see you again next week. Okay. All right, down the path. We come to that exception that I was talking about. Some coniferous trees actually do uh, lose their needles in the winter, and this is a bald cypress, and this is one of them. Now, one way to tell that a conifer tree is deciduous is that usually they have really light and feathery needles. They're not as pointy and not as pokey like that last Norway spruce that we just saw. Right now, this growth on all of our bald cypresses are really vibrant and chartreuse, which I just absolutely love. But there's another way you can tell if one of these trees is a bald cypress, and that's the knees. So these trees uh, traditionally get knees that spout out around the trunk. The, oftentimes you'll find bald cypress by water, but they don't have to grow by water. They still develop the knees either way. And scientists actually don't know why they have knees. <laughs> There's a lot of different theories, but as of now, it's still truly one of nature's mysteries. We're going to head on to an archway. This is the um, glade arch. I had a moment, even though I know what this arch is. <laughs> now the landscape between the conservatory water and the East Drive is actually called the glade. And this arch is really fitting. When you walk through it, you find yourself, yourself in this really shallow valley and it has this really beautiful shady tree cover. This is actually one of the first arches in the park. It was very early on. Uh, it was completed in 1862. But before we go under, I want to go up. This is the top of Glade Arch. All the arches and bridges in Central Park were designed to aid in the flow of traffic, be it on foot or by horse or by carriage. Looking at this pathway uh, in this arch, you might notice that the right side, it kind of ends very abruptly and then it transitions into grass. And Calvert Vox, the architect of these arches, he would never have left such a jarring edge. And it looks like this today because we're actually missing a pathway, sort of. This is a map that I really love. It's a segment of a map from 1873. You can find this beautiful map on the New York Public Library's digital archive. And I love it for its detail. But I want to look close at the area around Glade Arch, which is right there in that square. You'll see that historically, there were two separate pathways that crossed over the arch. There's a pedestrian path, uh, which would be on the left, and then a carriage path, which would be on the right. And that actually allowed carriages to exit at 79th Street. Now, later, this section of the carriage drive, it really just morphed into one smaller pedestrian path. So the arch stayed wide, but the path got much smaller. And I want to point out a few additional features that we see in this map. Uh, you can see Cedar Hill. And so Cedar Hill is up here where I'm moving my cursor. And all the little asterisks, these are conifers. It's how the cartographer uh, showed what was a conifer versus what was a deciduous tree. This is the glade that I was talking about. But now we're going to move toward the focus, which is conservatory water. So we walked along the base of Cedar Hill. We walked under Glade Arch. We're going to head toward conservatory water. But first, we're going to stop at a playground. And I want to bring out our inner child. Uh, so get ready to reach back into your youth. This is the James Michael Levin Playground. Originally, it was constructed in 1936. Uh, one of the many playgrounds that were put into the park around that time. It's been restored a number of times with a huge recreation done by the Central Park Conservancy in 2010. In addition to adding new features and better connecting the playground to the landscape, uh, all of our playground reconstructions really focus on accessibility to make sure as many people can enjoy these spaces as possible. And I want to shout out the playground partners. It's a program that's run by the Central Park Conservancy Women's Committee, and they do incredible work. They raise the money for the restorations and the daily care of our 21 playgrounds, and I think we have some of the best in the city. You can see that the water feature's on, and it's good because it's very hot, but I want to zoom in on that pedestal in the middle. 
I promised you whimsical statues. This is more of a sculpture, but it falls into that whimsical category pretty well. Uh, we have an Alice in Wonderland statue in Central Park that's very, very famous, but this is a close-up of that pedestal. We have another Alice in Wonderland statue. Uh, Alice holding her croquet flamingo. She's on the left. The Mad Hatter is right in the middle with his teacup, and the Queen of Hearts is on the right, and she looks like she's ready to behead someone. This is in the middle of a splash pad, and it was actually the Sophie Loeb Memorial Drinking Fountain originally. It was by the Heckscher Ball Field in the southern end of the park. And just below the character's feet, which you can't actually see, there are little spouts that had drinking water that came out. It was moved here during a 1980s reconstruction of the playground. And really, this sculpture or this statue. Um, it's one of the many, many surprises in Central Park. There are veteran park goers who's, who've been coming for years who didn't know that this really incredible thing is here. All right, we have come to conservatory waters. There it is. You can see it peeking out behind those trees just at the base of this path. The map, one last time. We're gonna circle the waters and then end at the northern section and I'll show you the other Alice in Wonderland statue. Now, I love conservatory water. I'm really excited to show it to you. Uh, Central Park, the Central Park Conservancy manages <laughs> Central Park and Central Park has both a conservatory water and a conservatory garden, but we don't have a conservatory. And I'm going to tell you about why that is. But if you're interested in the conservatory garden, uh, you can check out our weekly walk from May 6th. And that one, again, is on the website. This is the reason for conservatory water. Back to that map. So conservatory water is the blue oval that was constructed in 1858. It was very early on in the park's history. And it was actually constructed to serve as a reflecting pool for a conservatory or a greenhouse, but one that never came to fruition. The orange building just below that blue opal, that is the proposed conservatory. But even without the conservatory, this reflecting pond has always proved to be a peaceful respite from really busy Fifth Avenue. It's just up the hill. And I also want to note that humans aren't the only creatures that find this place peaceful. This family of ducks has been here all season. Our visitor engagement team, or visitor experience team, they noticed them very, very early on back in May. And it's a mama mallard, and then she's got seven uh, originally little yellow fluff balls, and now they're kind of little brown fluff balls. They are delightful. And it's another reminder that Central Park is a really vital part of a humongous ecosystem here in New York City. And if you joined the weekly walk last week uh, at the Fort Landscape, I showed you a video of a turtle. Well, just take a moment and block out everything and relax and just watch nature be adorable. Still going. <laughs> it was, it's always fun to see them. And it's, again, really fun to see the park kind of grow and change. And it's great to have seen these little ducklings and then see them get big. Uh, as we continue along the path, we come to the Alice and Edward A. Curbs uh, Memorial. It's the memorial. It is the Curbs Boathouse, more colloquially. And it's on the site of that original proposed conservatory. It was built in the 1950s and it replaced an older wooden structure. And I really love how the ivy grows up along the side of this building. And that ivy and that tall spire, they make me think of a storybook castle, which is really fitting for this area of the park. Usually around this time, you're gonna find people checking out small radio controlled sailboats uh, to sail around conservatory water. But people were actually doing this long before the boats were radio controlled because conservatory water has long been the spot for model boat racing. Of course, when I was there, there were no boats uh, in the water as Curbs Boathouse is not open, but we can pretend that's what they look like. 
keep pretending with me. Let's imagine that it's 1945 and we've come today to sit along the sparkling waters and watch a boat race. What's this? A commotion. The wasp, one of the boats, is being captained by a small mouse in a sailor outfit. The next few minutes, there, there's a huge commotion, uh, a storm and a collision, but then straight and true sailed the wasp with Stuart at the helm. After she had crossed the finish line, Stuart brought her alongside the wall and was taken ashore and highly praised for his fine seamanship and daring. That's from Stuart Little, uh, written by E.B. White in 1945. And Stuart does indeed take the bus to 72nd Street and race on this very pond. Two more stops, two more stories. Tucked in a nook off the west side is a man sitting on a granite bench, and he's really shaded by this beautiful leafy canopy right now, and he has a hat that's next to him on the bench. His book is open on his lap. He's reading a story to a tiny swan. Uh, this is Hans Christian Andersen, uh, the Danish children's book author, and the bronze statue was added to the park in 1956, and he's reading, appropriately, The Ugly Duckling. And the opening sentences are actually etched onto his book. It was beautiful in the country. It was summer, the wheat fields were golden, and the oats were green. Uh, the story, of course, is about a little duckling who's teased for being different, and eventually he learns that he isn't a duck at all. He's a swan, and it's his difference that makes him so special. Uh, I love children's stories, and I want to take a quick moment to ask you what you love not about children's stories, but about these weekly walks. Uh, again, we've been doing 11 of them, and we want to keep providing content that you are interested in. So I'm going to launch a poll. It's multiple choice. Maybe pick two of your favorite things about these weekly walks. And I'll leave that up for just a while. Our next stop is our last stop. So Central Park uh, has many iconic statues. None of them are probably as whimsical as this bronze depiction of Alice uh, in Wonderland. It was donated to the park in 1959, and it was actually a gift to the children of New York City. The donor was philanthropist George Delacorte, and he commissioned this statue as a tribute to his late wife, and she absolutely loved reading Alice in Wonderland to her children. And if that name rings a bell, it's because Central Park has a Delacorte theater and a Delacorte clock as well. On the statue, you can see Alice with Dinah in her lap, and there's a white rabbit on the left, the Mad Hatter's on the right. And if you actually look close above Alice's left shoulder, uh, there is a Cheshire cat. He's looming in the background. This right here is one of the details. This is the Dormouse, who was a sleepy guest at the Mad Hatter's unbirthday party. A very merry unbirthday to all of you, unless it's your birthday. In that case, merry birthday. Happy birthday, whatever. <laughs> uh, both the statue of Hans Christian Andersen and the statue of Alice in Wonderland, they were really designed with kids in mind. They were built to be climbed on, although they do get very hot in the summer. And you can really see that they've been polished by generations of tiny hands and not so tiny hands. And the details of this are really incredible. And no matter how many times you visit, no matter your age, you can't help but really want to get up close and explore. The statue is really picturesque, and you get a new view with every stop or every step as you circle the statue. My favorite part is actually on the ground. All around the statue are quotes from Lewis Carroll's works, which includes the nonsensical poem, The Jabberwocky which is about as whimsical as you can get. And since whimsy is one of our themes today, these are my parting words. Twas brillig and the slivy toves did gyre and gamble at the wave. All mimsy were the burrow groves and the moan wreath outgrabe. I wanna thank you so much for visiting Central Park with me today. It was a pleasure having all of you. Uh, I will reveal real quick the poll. So it looks like people really enjoy seeing the history, uh, seeing Central Park in real time, having something to look forward to. 
uh, it's really exciting to know these things so that we know what to include in the walks moving forward. So thank you very much. Our weekly walks are just one way that you can stay engaged with Central Park virtually right now. Uh, there's other ways you can stay connected and you can do that by visiting the My Central Park page on our website. On the My Central Park page, you can learn a little bit more about how Central Park has served as a respite in times of crisis. You can read stories about why the park is important. You can share your own stories. You can download coloring pages and discovery activities and Zoom backgrounds. I'm gonna leave this room open for just a few minutes to make sure we grab any last questions. So if you asked a question and are waiting for an answer, just stay tuned. I'm gonna be leading next week's walk. We're gonna to go to the pool, which is at 100th Street, and it's a beautiful water body, and it has some incredible trees. Last week, one of our viewers, Barbara, said she liked the trees. Barbara, the trees I included today are for you. Next week, I hope you tune in, there'll be more trees. So until then, from the Central Park Conservancy, stay safe and be 